why the rhapsodes in Plato's time competed with theater. Not, uh, well, I mean, the, the, I'm, I'm not sure what to say that they were, I mean, it wasn't so different that they weren't thought of as uh, actors. Uh, they performed solo without an instrument in front of a crowd. And uh, they had a text with all these musical cues in them that you could exploit one way if you want to uh, emote and project, and another way if you want to chant. And uh, as I mentioned, there's a passage in Aristotle that's interpreted to mean that some people went too much one way and others went too much the other. It wasn't the hugest movie of recent years, but there was a big splash about that film called Troy. Didn't have all that much to do with Homer, in my opinion, but um, I mean, it was it was fun. It was a lark, um, but I think it's it really comes down to um, everything that you apply that word epic to. It is a, still a very current and broadly used word. So I'm thinking primarily of movies and of the arts in general. Um, uh, I mean, to be fair, the influence of Greek tragedy is sometimes more uh, uh, more powerful. I mean, that when you think of the trilogies, for example, like um, Star Wars, one, two, three, or The Godfather. Um, you think of uh, those kinds of, I mean, th th that structure, it, it, I think, has more in common with Greek tragedy. Uh, and. And tragedy has its own wellspring for out of lyric poetry. Um, but when, uh, I mean, we can still use this word Homeric uh, uh, or epic to refer to something that's just larger than life, that um, changes things, a game changer, an epic victory. I think so long as there's this um, openness to the idea of something not scripted. And uh, so it's a backwards way of saying, which happened as though there were no benevolent guiding hand of God in it. It was all the same huge, not scripted, but huge, <laughs> as though there were giants walking the earth. Uh, something epic happens. Now, I mean, uh, Epic has a, a peculiar way of expressing itself. I was thinking on the way over about this passage early on in Iliad 1, when Athena comes down from heaven and grabs Achilles by the hair. Uh, he's about to go and kill Agamemnon. And it said that nobody else could see her. Now, now Athena, uh, in other manifestations, is this horrific, horrifying, um, sky god, uh, incredibly powerful. She wields the aegis with many tassels and everything. But inside of Homer, um, she has this capacity to be a kind of, well, it's very tempting to read it psychologically, as though Achilles had a, a, a divine thought. Right? Um, th I mean, that sort of isolates him because he sort of just sees more of the scene than everybody else. That's why nobody else can see her. It's that kind of idea, right? That he's more a bigger consciousness of what's going on. Sees the big picture and holds back. When it's put in terms of the goddess visited him, pulled him by the back of the hair, and uh, he obeys. But what I really feel <laughs> You know, when I read that, is the tug on my hair. And it's really in our language all the time. I mean, for example, when you say to yourself, oh, I was going to do such and such, but something held me back. You, really? Held you back. Like this. I mean, what does it mean? Uh, I. I the idea that there are these forces uh, whose sources uh, you're not really sure of, but that guide your decisions or make your decisions seem merely apparent, but are in fact things that you were following or obeying, uh, those are epic moments too. And it seems to me they're 
they're, um, they're happening all the time. Uh, even in coffee shops, Homer was actually being read in here, probably for the first time, but probably not for the last. I mean, it, it, as I said, the Odyssey is the book to go to to find the incongruity of the epic and the mundane. So Homer sort of covered all <laughs> reality in this uh, in his way of dealing with epic. And I, I, in fact, I should have responded. You know, when we we were speaking about um, Homer being the source of things. Uh, a later Greek culture, there's every indication inside Homer that uh, th these works are the end of something. Uh, I mean, that whatever was there that allowed these things to be produced, that, uh, that you know, the context, the, the oral minstrelsy, the events of the Trojan War, um, all of these things, <coughs> and and uh, more important than all of that is the tradition of poetry uh, had an end result in Homer. And, uh, it, as I said, the, the best evidence is that these poems were adopted uh, by the later uh, Greeks. So we're in a long line of people who have been uh, adopting uh, Homer for our purposes. <clears throat> the pattern of the Odyssey seems to be um, simply ubiquitous. Uh, the whole notion of return, uh, the whole notion of, let's say, the epic and the mundane uh, blending. I mean, I thought, I'm sure um, James Joyce thought he was being brilliant and original in doing that in, in uh, Ulysses, but Homer did it first. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, yeah, the influence is very, very uh, uh, strong with the Odyssey on that literary level. The, when it comes to the Iliad, I don't know what to say except that we, we live in a, in a warlike uh, and a strangely chaotic uh, world. And to some extent, going to Homer, uh, can yield some clarity about motives. But in my own experience, I don't know, I'm either sorry or happy to say it's an escape from this world. And uh, long may it be so that an epic remain that way. Uh, I think it's been an outlet for many, many different kinds of ages, the, the composing and the listening to epic poetry. Uh, David Green um, was my teacher. Uh, really, I think of him as my first teacher of Greek, but I had done a number of years of Greek uh, before that. But he opened my eyes to the possibilities of so many di on so many different levels. Um, he's an Irishman uh, to his dying day. He was an Irishman uh, and an American. <laughs> he farmed six months of the year in Ireland. Uh, visited him on the farm. I mean, real dairy farming. And at the end, there was the pigs, a little bit more money in that. And then he would come and take care of his, his flock of graduate students uh, in Chicago. Um, that most of the years I was there, he taught for free because they weren't allowed to pay him after the retirement age. So um, he was a very special person. It was him and also a man named Arthur Adkins in the classics department. Both of them now uh, departed, I'm afraid. Uh, he, um, they were very, very different people, but very fond of each other. Arthur was a bit younger. But uh, that was my experience of the epic and the mundane uh, mixing as I look back on it. It was as though giants walked the earth. Uh, most people are very lucky if they find one teacher, and I had two. Uh, they were just, they taught in the offices, and that's, I think, the most wonderful thing about American universities are these back offices where real teaching happens, not, you know, on the front pages. But, um, David uh, was from another era uh, where, you know, you learned your Greek uh, as a child, 
so that the, the paradigms and things get came into your system in a really different way. And when he came over to America, he was sort of plucked <laughs> by um, uh, Robert Maynard Hutchins, who was then a very, very young man, but he was president of the University of Chicago. He had heard about this star in uh, Ireland, this translator. They brought him to Chicago, decided he needed an education, sent him to Vienna. He was there in the 30s, uh, the rise of Hitler and so on. I uh, saw some very interesting times um, and lived with them all. He was a historian as well as a classicist. And uh, he brought all of that to bear on, uh, on what he taught. Now, the key for David was something that unfortunately I and almost anybody else now raised in the classics can never recreate was that childhood upbringing in the language so that there was a familiarity. Right? Uh, what, uh, I mean, this uh, native familiarity. He couldn't recite. I, I, one of my great achievements was to persuade him that I, what, the way I read it was um, accurate in, in reconstruction. His wasn't anything like that. It was some sort of uh, modern Greek hodgepodge thing, but it, w it came from the heart, and that counted an awful lot. But, um, he, um, because he had learned the language sort of from the inside as a kind of philological thing, this uh, grammatical, uh, dictional world. He came to America as a very young man, and the University of Chicago, whence you know the core curriculum and the great books programs all um, uh, emerged, he found these students who uh, cared about what it all meant, <laughs> and that was just an amazingly happy thing for everyone involved. It's what led to his producing the Green and Latimer translations and so on. That there was a need in this world for uh, translations that allowed people who couldn't go to the Greek, uh, as he not necessarily went to, but had in his blood, to uh, get in contact with uh, this literature, uh, would somehow do good. And he was right about that, because that didn't really exist in when he came up. As, uh, a mutual friend uh, Stephanie Nelson, his longtime companion, uh, tells me, you know, that, that was something new under the sun. Uh, it just this idea that you could read, you know, Sophocles and um, feel like you'd read Sophocles without going and <laughs> spending many years in the classics department. Uh, these were students who cared about what it meant, and that was the essential sparked for the powder keg for him, because he had all of this latent uh, knowledge uh, that was ready to ignite upon their interest. He'd never heard those kinds of questions. All he'd heard was the philological kinds of questions that managed you know, to make everything boring. Uh, it, it's a very special experience that I would wish uh, on everybody uh, who is fortunate enough to uh, have the opportunity to go to graduate school. Um, I'll just say this, in I don't know who it'll reach, but the most important thing about graduate school is finding a mentor, finding someone uh, you're willing to submit to, essentially. It's not uh, what we're taught to do as Americans, but it's the key. You have to find somebody worthy, you know, like Lancelot. 